Hi, everybody. This is Rachel Yucatel. I'm so excited to be on the Hollywood Raw podcast today, talking about everything that I've gone through in my life from working in nightclubs to being hounded by the paparazzi. So um, I can't wait for you to hear my story. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Hollywood Raw YouTube page. Make sure you drop a comment, like, subscribe. Do all the fun things. Follow. Follow everything. We're here to entertain you guys. What are you waiting for? Hurry up. Let's go. Enjoy. All right, guys, today our guest is, well, sort of infamous, maybe from a little story you may have heard of, and if you haven't, go Google it, uh, but she is now podcasting and has a fantastic new podcast out called Misunderstood. I happen to be her premiere episode guest, but we got Rachel Yucatel on. Thanks for coming on and joining us. Thanks for inviting me. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here with the two of you. <laughs> I don't know if it's an honor, but we'll take it. You know, hey, listen. <laughs> Now, Rachel, I, I have to say, you know, um, I did your podcast a couple weeks ago, and I, I really like the concept behind what you're doing. And I a lot of like what we talk about on a daily basis, which is how news headlines can really define, well, define a situation, define people and kind of change their their story. So I I'm definitely want to get into all of that because I, I like I was telling Adam, I just think it's a really fascinating look into people's lives and how a headline can just change everything for them. But let, let's start at the beginning and of, you know, kind of when people started to get to know you. And that's uh, when you came up in this like New York nightlife. And was this was this fun? Was this your actual job? Well, tell us more about the nightlife era of your of your life. Sure. So I was actually getting a divorce and I just, I decided to drive across country with no destination. And I literally got into a car. Um, I told my husband at the time I wanted 30 days to not speak at all and figure out like what would make me happy. And, um, I enlisted a girlfriend of mine. She got in the car with me we packed up my two dogs and just two bags and started driving. And that night, um, my old friend and ex-boyfriend from when I was very, you know, a lot younger called and said, what are you doing? I told him I was driving. He said, well, if you want to come to Las Vegas, I'm opening a nightclub here and uh, I'd love to have you. you. You know, I had come from working at Bloomberg Television and I was, you know, you know, a professional. He's like, all the girls here are either strippers or waitresses. I don't know any of them. I don't trust them. So I, I need you. Can you come? And so I hit that little button. Remember on those in the car, how you used to have the button on the top and you talk to somebody. Yeah. So I said, can you, can you download into the map, the directions to Las Vegas? And I did that. And we drove 10 hours a day and we got there by Wednesday. And I, my grandparents lived there at the time. And I, uh, they lived in the Las Vegas country club estates. I called, um, you know, a broker and I said, by Wednesday, I need I want to be on in a house with a pool on a golf course. Um, and I drove up, he had his keys, you know, in his hand. I'll never forget this guy named Malcolm bird. And he, uh, had a five bedroom house. It was like less than $2,000 a month, um, coming from New York city that seemed like a huge deal. Right. And he had fully furnished it. And I walked in and I started my, my job that night at Tao in Las Vegas and it hadn't opened yet. Um, and it was opening in a month and I was going to stay there only you know, for a couple, for a month, basically, and just a short term thing, but it gave me such a purpose. Um, and I was so good at it right from the beginning. I mean, I, people that don't know my history, I became sort of known as the first lady of Vegas because I started dating Jason again, who was my past boyfriend. Jason so Strauss, who is the guy who owns, he's the partner in Tal Group. Yes. And so yeah. we had been each other's first kiss when we were 12. So we were very comfortable and knew each other. And, um, so, and I started running his business for him and I became the director of VIP operations. And my job was to literally take care of how the room was sat, how they made money, um, and then deal with all the celebrities. Um, so I had all these great qualities from working in Bloomberg news where I was producing a live television show. And I kind of took that, those qualities and that experience. And I had never done this job before, but those that same, you know, experience kind of crossed over. And so I was able to, the doors would open and it was like producing my own live show. Everything that could go wrong goes wrong. I, I was able to figure it out, juggle it, juggle all sorts of people and know how to <clears throat> sit a room to have them spend money. And the Tao group is so good at 
customer service and teaching their employees. So um, they were really good at teaching me and I, it, I thrived at it. And I ended up um, getting a divorce from the guy I had left New York and staying in Vegas for about five years and, you know, taking their company from the opening day to a company that was making like a million dollars a night, you know, sometimes um, and cultivating a client. And people don't realize there's so much that goes on to the bottle service business and hospitality like that. But there is a whole, you know, behind the scenes thing that is a real business. It's not like, you know, drugs and sex and fun. I mean, I was working the whole time and I loved it. I was so good at it. So then I came back to New York um, and I opened up a bunch of properties for the Tao Group in um, in Manhattan and St. Bart's and the Hamptons. And from there, I went on, went on to kind of get stolen from them and work for different companies like the Light Group and, um, you know, uh, a bunch of other ones that I, you know, the Griffin I would, I opened and um, Pink Elephant and all, all sorts of different places. So I, I did that for many years. Is, is it crazy like nightlife? Because you were pretty much running nightlife in Vegas when nightlife was the biggest thing. Like, you know, you're, you're a New Yorker. New, people really, there's not much nightlife anymore. Even in Vegas, I feel like it's definitely kind of quieted down. You know, it's not the same excitement. But when you were there, it was the wildest because, you know, the tabloids were really trying to get some stories with what was going on inside the clubs. It was kind of the height of bottle service, you know, and the start on, I mean, from what I know, the start of bottle service when you were starting to work there and there was so much illusion of what was going on, you know, behind the scenes in the VIP section. So when you're running a VIP section, what exactly are you doing? Are you just putting in the celebrities, putting in hot girls, then the rest of the people are people who are willing to spend the money. Like what does that section look like? Yeah. So there's like a formula to it, right? So the celebrities wouldn't pay to come, right? Because they were coming for free. And sometimes they would get a lot of money to to come and just be present there. So that was the celebrity category. Um, and they also used the celebrity names to get people to come into the club. So if they knew Paris Hilton at the time was really big, if they knew, Mad you know, Madonna came in one night, um, Britney Spears. So when we would know they were coming in in advance, we would use that to promote the club. Now, not that they were going to spend time with anyone that was in the club besides who they came with, but that was enticing to people to come that night because a celebrity was there. Um, so sometimes we would pay celebrities to come and sometimes we just knew they were coming in. And so we'd have to cater to them. But then what makes a room work is that you have the bottle service people that are spending the money, which could be anywhere from, you know, their minimum could be a thousand dollars to, you know, $10,000, depending on the table they get. And then to make them spend money, you know, you have to cultivate this client, so to speak, you would have the promoters that were required to bring in 25 models and the models had to stay a certain amount of time. And then I would know that, you know, if a guy was coming in with eight guys and I was making him spend, you know, $5,000, well, they can't drink that much alcohol by themselves. So I would put the models next to them. And then I would, it would be my responsibility to either send a host up there to you know, integrate the two so that it could upsell the bottles and make them spend more. Or I would figure out a way to sit the room so everybody was sort of interacting and spending more money. And it's interesting because when I first got there, the bottles, the table started at like a $500 minimum. And the most we could ever, you know, would ever ask was 2,500. And that was like, a ton of money. But then we got to the point where I was cultivating a client where um, it was my client, as a matter of fact, that spent the most money on bottle service in one night, which uh, was $250,000. And that was in Las Vegas. And that happens to be Paul Kemsley, which is PK on um, the Housewives of uh, Beverly Hills or whatever it is. So now he's gone off to, you know, become famous in his own right. But at the time he was famous in bottle service um, life because he was the biggest client. And so other um, companies would call and say, oh, Wait, can you sorry. get what what do you have to buy to spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a single night? So for hit for, for example, to get him to that number, um, there was a go go contest that night, I remember. And I I said, OK, PK, you get to you can actually be one of the judges. And he thought this was so fun, right? So then we give him the mic and then he has access to the DJ and telling them what to play. And he feels like the entire room that now has 5,000 people is looking at him. So then he's like, okay, I'm going to get drinks for drinks are on me for everyone in the room. And then, and then it turned into bottles are on me for everybody in the room. So it became, you know, he was buying for literally every table. So that's how you get them to spend that much money. It's not that on them good. buying drinks at their own table. That is insane. But how many times do people? That was. How many times do people, when you get those type of bills, when they see it at the end, they just get pissed off and just want to argue about it? Like, hey, you know, I'm a little messed up. You guys try to sell me on 
an extra few bottles and I was messed up. I wasn't in the state to make that right decision. Right. So it's really funny you ask that. Not many people have asked me that before. Before anyone walks through a rope um, on the bottle service line, there, there was something we could have called a commitment envelope. So I would have to say to them, and I still remember it in my head, I would have to take their credit card and ID and I would say, okay, um, I just have to remind you, your minimum is $10,000 and you need to sign here because you're showing a commitment that you're going to spend that much. And at the end of the night, I'm holding on to your credit card and ID already. So we already know you're spending that money. He's like, yes, he would have to say yes. I had a camera behind me in case they ever, you know, disputed it. And then also um, I had their signature. And then part of my job was to kind of follow up and go upstairs or send any of my hosts upstairs kind of at closing when all of these bills were closing out because they couldn't get their credit card and ID back unless they got the commitment envelope back and signed their bill. Um, and so if it was ever called into question, which oddly enough, it really wasn't because we did such a good job of making sure that when they were sober, they were agreeing to it. But I would go upstairs and I would make sure that I would be there for the signing of the bill. And if there was ever an issue, um, you know, I would be the one talking to them and I was always sober. And part of my contract was that I would go upstairs and drink with them and they would buy shots for me or they'd be like, what you know, champagne do you want? And of course we were taught to say the, you know, most expensive kind of champagne, but I didn't drink. So the girls knew they had to put water in my vodka shot or diet ginger ale in my champagne drink. So I had my wits about me. It was my job to be their wingman, their gatekeeper, to know their girlfriend, to know their wife, to know everything that they liked and be the yes girl, you know, but keep them. I love that. That is so fascinating. Rachel, when you pay a bill, let's say that bill is $10,000. I have to, am I expected to tip 20% 20% on a $10,000 bill, even though the girl is like the price is the bottle, but like, really, it's not like she's doing more work because it's $10,000. Cause I, well, I'm so I'm expected to give a $2,000 tip on that. Yeah. So it's funny. These girls are trained really well. So I have never come across a situation where anyone has said, Oh my God, wait, I have to tip on top of this. Um, because by the time they leave at the end of the night, they want to marry their, the girl that was their, you know, the person hosting at their table, right? So these girls really know what they're doing. And for the most part, they would get tipped higher than expected because they did such a good job. I mean, they, they know how to work their table and they know how to, also we would train them really well. Like not only would they show attention to, let's say you or Dax were, were buying the, the bottles, but they knew how to also not um, negate the women at the table. Cause sometimes wives would get mad and because the girls that are working there are so hot. Right. So they would make sure that they would cater to the women at the table to make sure everybody felt comfortable. And usually the men appreciated that the woman wasn't getting so mad. So it, it, it all worked out. The, the, uh, bottle service girls are always tipped very well. And, uh, that's what they live off of. They live a nicer life than most people. Not, Unless not as much clear, now. I wouldn't be buying a bottle. I'm too cheap for that. Because I, I know the regular price of them down at BevMo. Now, <laughs> no, it's true. It's crazy. I have rich so friends insane. for that that I tag along with. Yeah, but I don't think it happens as much as it did back then. I mean, I don't hear about it as much or or clients like that. But you know, we also trained our girls to write thank you, personal thank you notes. They could not leave at four o'clock in the morning until their thank you note had been written to the client. It had to be a handwritten note that we would send out for them the next day. Um, you know, saying three things about them that they remembered. So, and then they, that's again, how you, I keep saying it, but cultivating a client, these clients then want to come back. They want to request that same bottle service, um, girl. And, you know, I rarely go to, um, nightclubs anymore, but when I do, it's very hard for me to be present in them because I'm always looking at what's wrong and how they're not catering to customers as well. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, I know how you can make this guy spend so much more money if you just did your job better, but it's not, people don't really uh, have the same level of standards as they did back then. So, so who, who has been the best celebrity tipper you've seen come through one of your clubs? Floyd Mayweather was a really good tipper and he only, he didn't drink. I don't think he drinks to this day. Um, but he would come in, he would tip so much money to everybody. I mean, he'd walk up the staircase, he'd tip the host stand. Then he tipped the guys who were sending him to the table. Then I would come to the table and he would try and throw me money and just for sitting with him. And I'd be like, Floyd, no, you know, and I'd have him give it to the security guard or whoever, but he always came in with wads of cash. Um, I was such a good guy, by the way, and just would sit and sway to the music and want to make sure everyone else around him was having fun, but was drinking water. So he, he was a good one. Who are some of the other regular, like the people that were regulars in nightlife when you were working in nightlife? Like, I'm sure you saw Leo a bunch. 
Yep, I did. I was on a plane with him a couple of times. Um, it was always the same cast of characters that would be around a lot, you know, but, you know, at the time that was when um, the younger girls were popular. So it was like Lindsay Lohan, Vanessa Mil Milano, is that her name? Um, um, you know, uh, Paris Hilton, um, Kim Kardashian, those were the girls kind of, and even Britney Spears, you know, so when they came, it was like a lot of hype They and they could get paid to be there. And sometimes when we had customers, they would say, um, I will offer Kim $200,000 to come and sit at the table. But it's so funny because I remember meeting Kim for the first time. She was dating um, Nick Cannon, I think, and yeah. they were doing the little red carpet coming up to the, to the host stand. And I remember saying to somebody next to me, because Nick was the celebrity at the time, and I was like, who who's that girl that he's with? Cause she kept turning around and showing her body and her ass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Can I curse? Sorry. And, um, this was before she was Kim Kardashian. Right. But she, she still was famous in her own right a little bit, but not like she is today. And I just remember being like, she has got a lot of confidence for the level of who she wasn't anybody. And people found that, you know, intriguing kind of. So, mm -hmm. um, Nick at the time was also, not really that big of a deal. Now, you know, he's on everything and has a million kids and whatever's in the news a lot. But um, they became someone that the cameras would flash a lot around because they had a lot of confidence. You know what I mean? Who, who would have been the, the person that you wanted to party with? If you weren't working, who is that one celeb that comes in and you're like, damn, that person knew how to have fun. They were the life of the party. They would be someone you would say, I would go out and party with you if I wasn't working. Oh, gosh. The person that had the most fun was um, Jamie Foxx. He would come in with a group of like maybe 15 to 20 people, um, even his family members. And remember, I believe his sister um, has a little bit of a disability. He would even bring her in and, and they would enjoy their time so much. And the entire energy of the club would change because of, of him. And he was very funny. He had us poor. Here's a little thing about him. He would have us pour out the vodka bottles and in the vodka bottle, we would have to put, um, sex on the beach. He loved that. That was his drink. <laughs> and so he would be in the club singing and gold digger would come on or whatever. And he'd start chugging the bottle of vodka. It looked like vodka, but it was really sex on the beach. So I thought that was funny. Um, but he had the best personality and was great. I mean, you have so many people that were, you know, so fun and interesting for me. It was people in my life who I, thought was so cool, you know? So like, I remember, um, I was, well, that's how I met Derek Jeter, but you know, Derek Jeter came in and that was like a cool person to meet, especially cause he was the ultimate in, in sports back then. Right. So, um, that's how I, I met someone like him or entourage was huge on TV and, and that's how I met all those guys and became friends with them. So, um, you know, I, I was very lucky because I, I never overstood, ever overstepped my bounds. I wouldn't sleep with any of these guys. I would just be really good friends with them and protect them. So they might want the most gorgeous woman in the room to come up to them. But at the end of the night, I was the one they were leaving with just platonically because we would have so much fun and they knew that I was like their buddy and they could trust me. Whereas all these other girls were throwing themselves at, at the guys being like, you don't even have to ask my name. We just want to be a part of your, you know, we want to go home with you tonight. So it was a very different dynamic. So I was in a good position to really get to know them and spend time with them. And all of them, you know, for the most part, were very interesting and down to earth. How was Derek Jeter in a club? Because you hear all the stories of what he would do. Like from what I was told, uh, hearsay, like about in New York, he'd only go out to three different spots. Like he only had his spots. He'd go like one of them was like random, like the W Hotel. He would yep. go to like a EMM groups, which is like a group spots but he'd go to these spots and he had a guy with him who would like basically pick up the girl for him and then but what was you know you were with Derek though correct? I was that's what yeah, I, you yeah. Dated Derek. so how did I you did how did you end up in a relationship or date Derek Jeter like how did that go down well I was dating Jason still when I met him and I met him in Vegas and we were just friends and then you know we would all kind of go to Cabo for New Year's and Christmas and um I was there with Jason and Derek was there in a house just down the beach from our hotel. So we would kind of run into them running. And over time, I became friends with him, you know, platonic friends. And then when I moved to New York, Derek obviously lived in New York and I would see him, he would come to my clubs and then we had something to talk about because he knew me and I was a familiar face. And then um, 
you know, I don't really remember how the first, you know, kiss went down or anything, but, you know, I, I started to go back to his house with him and become friends with his friends. And I was just, I was like a part of the group kind of. So, um, that's how, you know, I, I became somebody that he trusted. I don't think he's just, he's not the type to just like go sleep with anybody, by the way, he, he has to have a very specific, you know, um, type of girl he's looking for. And then somebody he trusts. And I had a great relationship with him because we were both very, I was doing my own thing. He was doing his own thing, but then we would come together when he was in New York. And I remember one time he lost, um, a major game. And one of his friends texted me and said, I need you to come to Derek's house or to his apartment. He just lost and uh, he wants you there. And I thought, Oh my God, like, that's so amazing. And when I got there, it was just him and I, and he was really depressed from losing a, a, a game. And we just sat and watched TV on the couch. And, you know, it wasn't like what people think of that when you date these um, celebrities that they're going to be all, you know, a certain way, but he was just a normal guy who had lost this baseball game that meant everything to him. And he was really depressed and he just wanted to sit with somebody that he didn't have to like deal with on an annoying level. And he knew I would just sit with him, watch the game over with him on the highlights, talk to him about other things. We could sit and have ice cream, whatever it was. And I could just be like normal with him instead of like in awe of him. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but I did go meet him at um, the W. As you're talking, he was down there, the underground thing where yeah. he would go and meet people. And that's actually where I met um, Tiger, was a friend of Derek's. And so when I was dating Derek is when Tiger came over to the house and we met together and he spent the night there with us. So when you were with Tiger, did Derek know? Um, well, I... I uh, my introduction you were, you were, and talk yeah. later in life to Tiger was Derek and I were no longer an item and Tiger came into my nightclub. It was called the Griffin. And, sure. um, I went up to when Tiger walked in, I, I said, Oh, do you remember me? I, I met you at Derek's house. We were all there one night and we spent time together and he did remember me. And, um, so then felt comfortable. He, he was very quiet in a club. So he, uh, you know, I went downstairs to do my job and he, um, kept having somebody come find me and say, can you go sit with, um, the tiger? So, uh, at the end of the night I said, well, here's my number if you ever want to come back. And then that's when, you know, he started texting me from the second, I think the car got to the light. He was already texting me after he left that night. How, how do you, I was gonna say, do you get nervous around celebrities? At the, I mean, uh, to see the people that you have dated are some really big names, very famous people like Tiger at that time was probably the most famous person in the world. Did you ever get nervous meeting these people, interacting with them or, or no? I didn't only for the fact that I had the perfect job where it was like, I had a reason for talking to them. I had a reason for not wanting anything from them. And they saw that. So they were more apt to trust me off the bat or have something in common with me. So I came in at a level that was more equal than some girl that just wanted to meet Tiger Woods or Derek Jeter or, you know, Ryan Seacrest or whoever it was. Um, I came in at a level that was like, Hey buddy, you know, like I'm right here. What do you need? Let me help you. You want me to find you a girl in the club tonight? No problem. I'll bring over the pretty girls. You want me to, you know, go have somebody go to McDonald's and get you French fries? Like Prince loved French fries. So we, when he would come in, we would go have somebody get him French fries and he wanted to hear certain music or whatever it was. So they liked me off the bat because I just was like their buddy. And so I never, no, I never felt um, intimidated at all by anyone because I was there for a reason. I had a reason to be talking to them. I wasn't in some desperate position. Mm -hmm. And then how did, how did it turn from hanging out with Tiger in the club to actually becoming some kind of romantic relationship with him? Um, well, without getting into too many details, I'll just say, um, you know, like anyone else, I didn't go into it thinking that it would be more than that because I, mm -hmm. I had boundaries with people that to this day are very important to me. I think it's important to have boundaries. Um, but I, um, I started to hear from him a lot and saw that there was somebody different than what other people knew of him. And I, you know, when a celebrity or somebody that you see in the news or in the paper or whatever, you read about them, all of a sudden when you're presented with being in their presence and then they really want you in their life and they um, can only do things when you're around or profess their love to you. Right. That's like 
how do you say no to that? Like, how do you, you know, you're swayed by that. So where I normally would have had boundaries on certain things, it was like, wow, this guy who everyone wants to know only wants to know me. And that, you know, was very attractive. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, I think the obvious question there that I think most people come to is uh, if you knew he was married, how does that affect like that relationship? Well, um, in relationships in general, when somebody is married, I want people to remember that sometimes, you know, men or women say a lot of things to the mm -hmm. people that they want to be around. Right. But I, let's just say this. I knew, um, tiger from when I dated, uh, Derek and I already knew that, you know, I had introduced a girl to tiger that night. So I had asked him about his marriage. This was a year or so before. And I, I think I had remembered, I mean, not, I think I, I had remembered that I thought I had seen something in people magazine of him, a wife and a baby. And so I wasn't sure if they were broken up or what. And he, you know, made it clear to me and in, in how he spoke to me that uh, I shouldn't worry about that, that that was something that he had an agreement about. So from years before, I, I just assumed that that was an agreement. But a lot of people, when they get involved with, you know, married people, um, it, it could be a really bad choice. And sometimes men are telling you things that are just not true. I mean, you guys remember from TMZ when I uh, kind of got caught dating, it wasn't even got caught. I dated David Boreanaz. He flat out told me that I knew he was married when he came into the club and he flat out said, Oh no, 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 I'm not. I live in the guest house, my wife. And he had a son, I think just one child at the time. Um, they live in the main house and we're, we're separated and, but we just don't want to make it clear to the world because I, you know, I'm a big actor and I had never seen Buffy the vampire slayer. That's not my thing. I'm not the target audience for that. So I, I just knew his face. I didn't know anything about him. And so he convinced me that that was, I mean, it didn't take much convincing because why would I think he's lying to me? So, you know, he told me that he was as good as single. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it wasn't until later and it might've been TMZ that, that came out with the story. I found out that his wife was pregnant and I remember asking him about that. And he said, Oh, she got pregnant before, you know, we decided to separate and, you know, still it's all kosher and it's all good. And, you know, it could have been in my head, a situation like when Giselle and Tom Brady got together and he had a baby with some, he was having a baby with his girlfriend. Right. So, you know, men will say anything to make the situation sound better. And of course there were some red flags and I should have asked more questions, but I just didn't, you know, at the time I thought that it was all copacetic because I had all these kind of people coming into my life and, um, the ones that really pushed hard for me, um, I had no reason to believe that I should be pushing back on them. You know, it was kind of their responsibility. I was single, you know? Yeah, yeah. no, I, I understand. So, you know, how does stuff like that leak that you're in a relationship, let's just say with, with Tiger, like how does that leak out that you're dating? Because I remember the day, I mean, you probably remember it clearly where you were when that moment if – your whole life changed, but like, how does it become? Well, Adam, here? have you watched, have you watched the HBO documentary? I did. On Tiger. I, I thought it was crazy fascinating for anyone who has not. Uh, Rachel is uh, one of the big guests in, in that HBO documentary and talks. And I feel like you're very candid and open during that documentary. Um, yeah. But it really talks, it tells the story of how all of that unfolded um, mm -hmm. And how that day came about and how that Thanksgiving was crazy. Yeah, Dax, uh, your like, holiday was ruined. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Rachel when I was on her podcast how my Thanksgiving was ruined. Nothing compared to her, probably her Thanksgiving, but yeah. um, just how the National Enquirer was doing a really big deep dive follow on Tiger for quite some time and then found out about the relationship with Rachel and went all the way to Australia and was kind of like spying on them. And uh, next thing you know, Elon got a call. And then Elon, what she called you, correct? Uh, I was asked to call her, as a matter of oh. fact, um, and have a conversation. Um, but yeah, so, but that was actually before it came out. Um, we, I'm not going to get too much into details because I'm yeah. saving a little bit of this, but I will say that um, we had been on like, 
a, a mission to prevent a National Enquirer story from coming out for about two or three weeks. And other media had called me too and said that they had found out about it, but I was able to convince them that that was not true. I said I worked for a nightclub and I was, you know, um, I, I was in the vicinity of where he was and that I knew him, but that didn't mean anything, right? And I was taking care of a client basically. And that you'd be ruining a lot of people's lives if you broke the story. So they held off. But the National Enquirer had two girls that had sold their story to them and I think did a lie detector test. So they decided that was enough evidence to print this story. And I um, had spent a good amount of time doing everything I could to prevent that from coming out. Um, I did not want this to come out at all. And um, I was more concerned for him than for me, but I should have been concerned for me because it really changed my life. But um, I, you know, when the National Enquirer story came out, um, I think it came out, you know, two days before Thanksgiving and no one seemed to notice it. You know, it was like, it was a stupid article and, it, you know, National Enquirer at the time was not um, known for having any real credible news. And what people came to find out is that National Enquirer, even though it looked like this tabloid that had crazy shit on it because it said like aliens here and so-and-so's gay. And I mean, they really were very good at breaking some very big stories, um, even though a lot of people wouldn't want to admit it. So they, their journalists were pretty spectacular on a certain level. But for years before, they had done a deal covering this up. I mean, they knew what was going on. So unfortunately for me, I think that, you know, the person that we're t talking about in this circumstance was really the metaphor I like to give is he was driving towards a cliff for quite a long time and had escaped death a few times, you know, or escaped being detected a few times. And I just happened to be the one in the passenger seat when he went over that cliff and I became really famous because of it, but it wasn't what happened with us that derailed everything. You know, there was a huge, you know, coming up before me. So listen, now, what, Rachel, uh, I was going to say, you I just wanted one... to ask one, hold on. I want to ask yeah. one question. Cause you mentioned Rachel, you said, I'm saving some of this. Mm -hmm. What do you, what are you saving it for? Are you, planning on putting something else out? Well, I mean, as you mentioned a little bit, I, I have a podcast where I'm telling a little bit more of my story. I think the reason why I, I, I decided to do a podcast after all this time is that, you know, it's been really hard for me to find my purpose and find what's important to me um, because it's been such a struggle um, for almost like for other people more than it is for me. This is a topic that people do not let go, right? And to this day, um, they talk about, you know, what happened and the downfall of Tiger Woods more than some other, you know, things that they talk about that just happened last week, right? And so my name is always dragged into that. And so um, I haven't been able to kind of get my footing in however long it's been 14 years because people still remember me as the monster that like took this scenario down. My life has always been Rachel, you could tell comma tiger woods mistress. And I've tried to reinvent myself a couple of times. I opened up a, a, an amazing store that won all these awards, but you know, it just, people would come in and still know who I was and it just was hard. And it was, uh, to this day, it's been really hard for me to get out of that cloud and that stigma and people really brand a woman in such a way that makes it like all of our faults and people have such anger, um, towards me, um, for something that doesn't have anything to do with them. Right. So it's been really hard for me to find my footing and get a, a normal job and, you know, uh, have people respect me and give my, have credibility for things, even though I was a person before I was a person after, and I was a very smart, credible person, you know, so it's been really hard for me. Um, so I felt like it was important to, um, start a podcast where I could talk about people that had their stories narrated by the media and the media only do that because it's the public's like, um, you know, appetite for what the media is putting out there. And so I get that, but it totally destroyed my life. I mean, not only did the situation I was in have an impact on me personally, right? Because that was a mistake and I feel awful, awful for it. And that was really hard for me to deal with and come to terms with, you know, what that's like and the guilt and the remorse, but then to have the entire world come down on you and blame you and take all their anger out on you for something that they're personally going through and it triggers something in them has been really hard. So my podcast is for people that, you know, want to tell their story in their own words because they feel like their story has either been misunderstood or it's been narrated by other people and they haven't had a fair chance to really talk about who they are. So 
you know, um, that's the premise for the show and that's become my purpose, um, to really get other people's stories out. And so I give a little bit of my life in each episode when I'm talking to guests and hopefully people will get to know me through this podcast. And if they choose not to like me, I think that's fair game because then they get me and my personality and my life story through that. But it wasn't okay with me having people dislike me or judge me based on what I, what was narrated for me. And then also I'm, I'm writing a book about my life, a memoir, because that scenario might be really interesting to people, but I have so many interesting things that have happened to me or that I've gone through or um, that I want to share with people that I just think the memoir is like a perfect opportunity for me to share that story. So I've how much, answer, how but... much can you actually write though? Because I mean, the NDA and the, the fighting with Tiger's team, obviously in a very public forum, a lot of people know about it. You had Gloria Allright on your side and all of this kind of stuff. How much can you actually say at this point? Well, NDAs, yeah, will prevent somebody from talking. And it's no secret that I, you know, had an NDA because we've had to now go to court for it. Um, I, long story short, and I, again, won't get into the details of it, but my NDA wasn't held up by their side of things. It was also an NDA that was written uh, written under pretenses that were not, um, smart. They were done very rushed. It was not in a way that protected me or made my life um, feasible in any way to become my own person and get my name back. So I've fought for the last, um, you know, probably 13 or 14 years to get the rights to my name back, not to tell the story of what happened that in that relationship or that night, but to be able to have my own voice and be able to tell the truth um, and be able to you know, just explain to people why I did things, what happened. Um, but again, the story is not about that. So um, NDAs, I still have an NDA, by the way, it hasn't completely gone away, but the circumstance and the bite to it has been, you know, I've won on a lot of accounts because they haven't held up to their end of the bargain. And it's, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in this David and Goliath situation where I've had to fight them and I've won every time because I think people will find that when I'm able to tell my story that you'll see that this was not done in, in a healthy norm or normal way at all. Interesting. When you, it was reported that you got paid $10 million for you, for you signing the NDA. When you sign an NDA like that, how much of the $10 million do you actually get? And do you have to give a percentage of that to the lawyer or how much do you actually get to take home? Um, well, the New York Times did a, a long article on me and my situation with the NDA. So I'm not saying anything here that's, that's you know, outlandish, but this is something that normally I wouldn't talk about. Um, but um, I was paid, a, you're paid a certain amount of money and the lawyers take, um, normally Gloria's fee is to take 40%. Um, I had negotiated with Gloria. And actually anyone who's listening, I would say, go back and Google that um, New York Times article because it's so brilliant and so well done because it really lays this out um, for people that want to understand NDAs in general. But, um, you know, I had negotiated a better deal with them because I felt like uh, I had negotiated my silence, so to speak, because I was being silenced. And I knew walking into it that I was going to have a scarlet letter that I had to take care of myself going forward. And there was a certain amount of money that I was willing to do that for. And if I had to, um, I, I, I wasn't coming into this saying, I want to tell a story. I want everyone to know because that's not how I felt at all. But I knew that my life was going to be forever changed because I was all over the news. Um, you know, TMZ led the forefront on this, but like everybody was covering this story and I couldn't get away from gossip stuff to, you know, the biggest credible news magazines or TV shows because all they wanted to know was the truth. And in an absence of the truth, they were making up facts. So, um, anyways, I didn't feel like the job was so well done for my lawyers. I was able to negotiate a better deal. I got them down to 20% and I, you know, I, uh, I got an amount that I felt like was going to be able to take care of me for the rest of my life, knowing my life was forever changed. I don't know that a lot of people think of it that way when they're signing an NDA, but they should. They should think, what is this worth um, to me? Not to be silenced, but what is this worth to me to lose everything about me? You know, a lot of people obviously know Gloria Allred's name and she's represented a lot of big people. You being one of her most famous clients, would you recommend her services to anyone else? 
Um, I don't like to talk badly about people, but I will say, um, you know, I, I picked her because I thought she was good in representing, um, good at representing uh, a, a case and a woman and helping me get out of a certain circumstance. I loved her partners. Um, I loved her at the time, but then I started to realize there's a formula to how this goes. And you rarely see Gloria Allred in trial, if ever. I don't think she's ever been in trial because her MO is something completely different. And the bottom line is that I felt like I really created a monster there. I think after me, a lot of women thought, oh, wait, I could go to Gloria Allred and I can get money to, uh, you know, not tell my story or to get 15 minutes of fame because she'll put me on a um, public display in her media, you know, stints that she does. And so, you know, if women really were concerned about their circumstance and their life, um, everything would be done behind the scenes and you would never know about them. But she puts a lot of this stuff out for public display. And so, Mm -hmm. no, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think women that feel wronged need to find the right lawyer to, um, you know, help them get what's right in their life. Um, so that's my opinion there. Okay. Did, did, when you dated Derek Jeter, did he make you sign an NDA? No, no, no. I've never had a famous guy ask me to sen- sign an NDA, probably for the fact that they knew that they could trust me. Um, Cause my intention of being with them was not for the fame of it. My job was to keep everyone's secrets a secret. So I think they knew that me personally, I believed in that as well. I mean, I did not want to become famous that way. I also had already been in the spotlight for before that, you know, uh, in September 11th, there was a, I lost my fiance, as you guys know, and I, Mm -hmm. there was a very famous photo of me that was in almost every newspaper in in the world. And so I was accustomed to what that's like when the media, um, you know, puts you on something and then everybody knows your name. And that takes a lot of takes a lot out of you, although it was a good circumstance for me because I didn't feel like I had to go through September 11th alone. So many people were looking for my fiance, Andy, with me. They wanted to know his story. They wanted to know um, everything about him. And I felt like it was a great way to, to get his, his name out there. Um, and it got me through many months of feeling alone. But I, I did see my firsthand experience of what that's like to be narrated into something because I was narrated into this young, fresh-faced victim who lost her fiance, you know? So the power of the media is really, you know, um, spectacular what it could do for somebody. And so quickly. Speaking of that, do you, you know, do you find this whole Stormy Daniels story that she is wrapped up in and uh, with Trump, do you, do you find it similar at all to your situation in regards to the media focusing on her rather than the man in the situation? Yeah, well, so many people just do that in general. They blame her, they question her motives, right? So Stormy, you know, I have my own story with Stormy lived in um, Vegas at the time. uh, And I knew her from being a girl in Vegas. And she actually came to me to ask me um, how she could get her story out about the affair with Donald Trump. And um, she told me the story. I remember the story. I remember her telling me that they were, you know, Shark Tank was on. I mean, not Shark Tank. um, Shark Week was on in the background. Um, I don't even know if she's told that part of it. But like, I just remember all the details to it. And I gave her someone's name at Us Weekly um, and at another paper to say, here, they'll probably pay you $50,000 or $100,000. And at the time, you know, I think she needed the money. She, you know, so wanted to get the story out. And their response, you know, we would have to ask her opinion and I'm supposed to have her on as a guest soon. So I'll ask her, but, um, I think, I believe they said something like, Oh, he's too famous. He was really famous in the apprentice at the time. And NBC, um, you know, kind of ran everything back then. And they were like, we're not going to print this story. This is, you know, we don't have enough facts. We're not going to have this backed up. And so I've always known that she had that, that story was true. So later on in 2016 or whatever it was that it came out, I was like, good for her because forget the money. I mean, I saw she had been paid $150,000, but at least she had her moment. And, and for whatever reason in the universe, it, that moment waited until right then so that she could be the one to tell what kind of a person this was, right? And so many people don't want to believe her. He still denies that they even had, 
this relationship or affair or whatever. But no matter what people say, I mean, and try to take credibility away because of her job or who she is. It's just totally ridiculous. I know for a fact that that relationship happened. Her details have never changed. And, you know, I think when people are offered money in a certain, certain circumstance like that, Sometimes, you know, $150,000 is a lot of money and it, you know, it helps with whatever situation you're in at the time. And so people take money for different things, you know, but, um, I think more importantly, she's amazing because of the time it came out because it just, it helped show what kind of person was going to come into office, um, if people voted for him, but you know, her credibility, unfortunately was not as worthy to many people as, as his. Interesting. When, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier, like, you know, these guys, a lot of celebrities just like in a club and, you know, if they want some girls to come to their table, they say, Hey, can you bring me some girls? How many of these guys have relationships that are just for the public or like there really is an agreement with the celebrity and their wife that they're allowed to just like, Hey, I'm in a relationship. We have kids. Her job's to raise the kids. She's, you know, funded but I'm allowed to just sleep with other people. Do we, do you, did you see a lot of that? Well, I did see a lot of that. I don't know that the women uh, were as um, amenable to that situation as the male, as the man said that they were, but I will say that I did know some couples that it was very obvious that the, that the wife was okay with it because she was liking the lifestyle. But if only if she was not getting hurt publicly, right? So as long as nobody nobody else saw the reality of it and she wasn't embarrassed by it, it could go on. She like kind of didn't want to know the details. But if it was found out, like um, remember Sandra Bullock, that whole mm-hmm. issue, you know, I don't know this for a fact, but I will say my personal opinion is someone like that, she's married to this guy and then it came out that he was dating not one, not two, but like four or five different women. I, you know, I believe that you can't, you, when you're living with somebody, you cannot just turn a blind eye all the time. But when the public found out about these women, there's no turning back. You know, you have to act like you've never heard about this before, that you're shocked and in awe and it's so hurtful. And I'm sure it is hurtful and humiliating, but I think a lot more women than you think are aware of the situation um, and will let it go on um, until or as long as nobody else knows about it. But the, you know, the breaking point is like, if, if it's found out, forget it. Cause you're embarrassing me. Um, and there were a lot of men too, that would cover up the truth about them. I mean, I know a couple big celebrities that there was two in, as a matter of fact, that would come in and in public, in the public life, they were straight in private, they were gay. And clearly for whatever reason, you know, for work or personal, they did not want to come out. So they would, anytime they would come to my club, they would bring their boyfriend and um, they would be secluded in kind of this area where not many people could see them and they would be making out with their boyfriend or dancing with them or whatever. And nobody to this day knows that these two guys are gay, um, but they are bisexual, but they, but they are. One of them's married and one is still single, but you know, when I see him in the paper, it's always about dating a woman, never about a man. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I won't ask you because obviously that would be not cool to reveal that. But, uh, but we'll let's... ask you when the podcast is over, of course. <laughs> uh... <laughs> um, Off the record. No, yeah. what I what I want to know is what it was like for you the day that not not the first time that the news broke with the National Enquirer, but the second time, the one that really. M- did a shit storm. Mm. How did your life change in that moment? Did you realize that your life was going to be forever changed and be forever tied to Tiger Woods right when that story broke? I did realize. Um, I think, you know, so many people have this misconception that like if they get famous, especially for 15 minutes, this is going to be great and it's going to change their life around. I hear about women or whoever, men, selling stories now to get people in trouble. Like I, um, you know, uh, I'm forgetting the guy's name now, but, um, you know, sometimes you hear about these mistresses that come out and sell the story because they want to embarrass them. They want them to lose their career. The girl thinks it'll be great for them because they can now start their bathing suit line or their lingerie line or whatever it is. And they don't realize this is going to affect their 
uh, the respect level for them or what they are tied to forever and on, right? So um, when I saw the news and I saw my name connected to it, I was like, oh, this is going to be a problem. But I have a background in news. I have a background as a journalist. So I also saw how I could see steps ahead of how it was going to unfold. I didn't know that I didn't know the negativity of people that I would get. I mean, I would get comments from people like, oh, I hope you get AIDS and die. Or if you ever have kids, they should be taken away from you or you're disgusting, dirty whore, whatever it was, which of course is so hurtful also. But I, I just could see steps ahead of like, I will never um, be a, a private person again. Like people will always connect me with this. And I, I did see how bad that would be because uh, right off the bat, um, there were um, the day after Thanksgiving, there were by four o'clock in the afternoon, there was like 50 paparazzi outside of my townhouse and um, I couldn't even get outside anymore. And that didn't end this. a long Rich, time. You were, you lived on, wait, you, was it 14th street you lived across? Yeah. So you lived right across from well, it was uh, it was a club for a little bit up and down or well, I forget yeah. where you you used to live in. A, it was like a brown building right across. It was a brown, brown, yeah, brown, it was, uh, it was, uh, and it had a nice st- set of stairs up it and yeah. it was brown, and it was right across from um, yeah, there was a club, but nobody ever went to it. Um, and- I remember the day, and I remember all the paparazzi outside your apartment, and it was just like it was. This was during a crazy time, and I mean, it was there was no escape. Like it was right in your front door. There was no escape unless, unless like I thought about it. It was like, would you leave your apartment at three in the morning just to kind of escape? Like when there no, maybe there was, not paparazzi. Paparazzi. there was paparazzi outside 24 uh, seven. It might be 50 people during the day. And then at night it might dwindle down to six or seven, but still I couldn't get out. Um, I had to hire a dog walker to come in and I had two dogs at the time to walk them. Um, I, tried to go to the gym a couple of times. I remember you guys have footage. I think of me being with my friend, Tim, who I was always with at the time, um, trying to just go two blocks to the gym. And I would be followed by that massive paparazzi. They would wait outside the glass doors, which was horrifying because I would go and try and do my workout. And then I would come downstairs and there was like a, like a little restaurant in the front. It was Equinox down there. And you know, everyone would see through the glass doors, all the paparazzi and they'd be like, who's that for? Who's that for? And I'd be like, Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. I have to walk outside and everyone's going to see it's for me. They're going to be like, who the fuck is this girl? Right. What's her story? What happened? And, but the things paparazzi were, as you know, are very nice by nature usually because they have to get to know who they're following. Right. And create relationships with, but at the time too, right at the beginning, some of the things people were saying were really awful. So it was really hard for me because I had never experienced that before. Um, And then I moved down to Florida for a couple months to get out of the spotlight. And I rented a house down there and still outside of the gate would I would have paparazzi out there as well. And it was um, it was really difficult. And I I became a recluse and uh, stayed in my house and didn't really talk to anyone. I lost all my friends, all my family. Um, You know, I had very few people in my life because I I couldn't even turn on the TV without the story being about that story. And then somehow, um, you know, come back to me because I was the only one that was found out later. There was like 15 other women. But so the heat got taken off of me a little bit, but not really because the story had to do with me. I mean, people didn't know at the time that I was on the phone when the, you know, when the accident happened and all that stuff. But it was just, um, they just knew my name from the, from the national Enquirer article that had come out three days before. So the speculation was why did they get into a fight? You know, the only thing they could tie it together with the domestic fight of why he got into the accident was because, um, Elin had, uh, found out about something. That was what everybody was tying together. So interesting. So did you hire a publicist? Did you hire like right away? Like, what do you do to protect yourself? Did, were PR people reaching out to you? Did you hire a crisis PR? What was, what did you do? And I feel like I I could start a crisis PR company at this point because I know so much about this. And I see these crisis PR companies all the time where I hear that people are hiring them. And I'm always thinking, why have I not thought of this? Because you cannot have somebody help you through a crisis that has literally not been through it. And I'm like one of the only people that's been through something like this. Like you can count maybe 10 women or men that have dealt with something like this. Right. Um, but it's hard to just take advice from somebody that literally has no idea what they're talking about. So, um, 
No, I had not. I did not call anybody. I, I had been through, you know, what I perceived to be big crises in my life before. So I knew I was very good at taking care of myself and figuring it out. I wasn't going to take somebody's advice. I watched a lot of Nancy Grace. I loved Nancy. And I saw a bunch of uh, lawyers that she always had on her show. So that's what I did the first night when I saw that my, my name was going to be affected. Um, I called all three, I Googled and I called all three of these lawyers and Gloria's office was the first one to call me back in like the middle of the night. So that's why I, ch- I chose her, but no, nope, I never hired a PR person. Um, anything. I just, um, Gloria became the PR sort of after that. Um, cause that's what she does, but no, I didn't even think to do that. I think nowadays a lot of people think, Oh, I need a manager. I need this. I need that, um, to get me through this, but nope, they can call me next time. You can DM me for my number. <laughs> When I was on your podcast, you mentioned that because of the headlines, you know, there were certain things in your life that people would close doors. You couldn't get your child into a certain school because you are Rachel. You could tell. Did you ever have a moment that you were like, I just want to change my name, dye my hair and become a new person so that you are no longer tied to that name? Of course, all the time. Still to this day, some things will happen and I'll be like, oh God, I wish I could have presented myself as someone else. Um, but, um, you know, it's interesting. My mother for a long time, uh, would say to me, you really should change your name. Your last name is too well known or whatever. Um, but no, cause I firmly believe that I, as I said before, I was a person before I was a person after, and I was not embarrassed of who I was and everyone makes mistakes and you have to learn from your mistakes and get through them to be able to become who you are to become a better version of yourself. So I wasn't, you know, at this point in my life, you know, I, I know now that I didn't do those things because I felt like I could overcome the stigma and I felt like I could overcome the horrific situation I was going through. And it never got to the point where I was like, I want to get rid of who I am as a person and completely start over because yeah, I made a mistake but I wasn't going to let that be something that destroyed who I was. I had built my life up to be a really interesting, great person. I had been through so much. I wasn't going to let that Rachel, you could tell die. And I still believe in that. So when people ask me if I regret um, that situation ever happening or meeting that person or anything that I've gone through, I always say, no, you learn your biggest lessons in the negative things that happen and in the traumas and in the, all the things that you have to go through in the struggles, because that makes you a better person. It made me figure out I can get through any circumstance that I ever need to. So I'm not embarrassed of myself. No. Yeah. I would when, feel like if I was like trying to get a, like a dinner reservation as Rachel, you could tell, I'd be like, oh, when they ask like what your name is on the phone, I'd be like, my name is uh, Rochelle, Uch, it, Uch, Uch, you know, like I would just start messing well, up my name. It's, to get it's the actually not, it's actually gotten me reservations or sometimes I'm it sure. does help. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was going to ask you, like, has there been any things that has helped you because of all this? I'm sure some doors have opened because of this from, you know, obviously dinner reservations, but has there been some cool things that have happened to you from it? I mean, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but yes, I mean, I've made it this far. Right. <clears throat> and the nice thing I guess I could say is that anytime I say my name, somebody will inevitably be like, oh, wait, I know you, you know, and it'll help in some way. And sometimes it hinders because they hear my name before they meet me. And then I have to work up to getting them to kind of forgive me or something. It's been some really horrible situations where people will refuse to be my friend because they don't like what they think I represent. But if I can say my name after they've met me, then their perception changes. And that's a really nice thing to watch that person be like, oh, wait, I think you're great. You're so much different than I thought you'd be, you know, and that ends up opening a lot of doors for me because people realize that, um, you know, they can't judge a book by their cover or whatever. Is it, is it hard to date being you? Oh my God. It's so hard to date. Um, you know, I, I online date cause I don't, it's not like I go to bars or anything. And, you know, it's interesting. I've had a couple guys, um, right off the bat, like I've gone on one or two dates with them and then they figure out who I am and they like give me this whole, we get into an argument because they're like, how dare you um, not be transparent with me and tell me who you were? And I'm like, I don't even know what you mean. Who am I? Like, what, what does that mean? And they're like, well, you didn't tell me that you're, you know, a Tiger Woods mistress or you used to date Tiger. And I'm like, 
you haven't told me who you used to date. You haven't told me what your biggest mistake is in life or what you're embarrassed about. And we get into this whole argument because I have to prove a point to them that they're not, not entitled to know about anything in my life until they get to know me. I would mm-hmm. never share that with somebody just like you wouldn't share what you're most embarrassed about or what your the thing is in the back of your head that gives you insecurity or where you learn, learn to, you know, we've lost a lot of confidence. Why would I talk about that? Right. I want to, put my best foot forward and talk about who I am now. By the way, that happened 14 years ago. The fact that people are still like offended by it is ridiculous because that's their issue, not mine. But it's taken me a long time to realize that. And, um, you know, I was dating a guy maybe a year or so ago who I dated for six months. We were talking about getting married, um, you know, all this stuff. And I remember he went he it took him six months to introduce me to his kids, which, by the way, they're all three grown kids. Um, And he was very anxious about it. Cause he's like, I'm scared to figure out how to do this. Should I tell them ahead of time who you are? And it drove me nuts that it was such an issue. I'm like, I'm your girlfriend. I don't know what's such a big deal and why you're getting so anxious about it. And we ended up breaking up after the first time I met his kids because for whatever reason, they were too judgmental about the situation. They thought all these keywords that people, you know, had said about me that I was you know, a mistress, a weapon of mass destruction, you know, a a gold digger, what, you know, whore, all these things that people said back in 2009, um, have, you know, and were written because it's written down in newspaper articles or, you know, that was their train of thought now, which is totally ridiculous. So I won't date anyone that, um, has an issue with me or who I was, because again, it's taken me a long time to say this, but like, I don't have any regrets about who I am now and what I've learned from things. So if they have an issue with it, that's their loss. And that's not the person I'm going to end up with. Right. But I'm still single because I haven't found someone who can kind of get over it. It's been really hard. Hmm. I also wanted to say, you know, it's like you just mentioned, it's been 14 years, but like when I watch the TV and we just had the masters and Hmm. tiger is all over the TV, he's all over the news. I honestly just look at him and go, oh, it's Tiger. When you see him all over the news, do you turn it off? Do you watch? Do you see how he's doing? Do you follow his career? Like, what happens for you when you see Tiger on TV? It's a really good question. No one's ever asked me that. Like, I was just at a, uh, I'm in Florida right now, and I was just at a outdoor kind of bar area, and they were playing golf, and Tiger, you know, came up. And uh, the girl I was sitting with, was like, oh my God, you know, don't look, but Tiger's on TV right now. And I'm sort of like, <laughs> again, this is other people's view of what they think is going on in, in my head. Yeah, I mean, I wish him the best. I want to see if he's going to win. I have, a, you know, a little more personal thoughts because it's like if one of your exes was on TV doing whatever. But, you know, I haven't seen him or talked to him in 14 years. You know, I just wish the best for him and hope that um, it all works out. But it's more uncomfortable for me what other people are thinking because, I, I tend to watch people that have already recognized me at the bar. He comes on and then there's like this look, they look over at me to see how I'm going to react. Or sometimes I'll see them take out their phone so that they can say to people, oh, I was watching golf. I was watching Tiger play when Rachel, you could tell was sitting there and, you know, or some people will even come up to me and, and ask me what my thoughts are on golf or start talking about golf with me. Like I'm some pro, you know, it's, it, you know, it's not, it's just a weird thing. So it's more, it's more uncomfortable for me to watch other people's reaction, but it's not hard on me. And you know, my daughter lo- loves watching, uh, golf. Sometimes she's young, but she, she's into watching sports. And, um, although she does comment, you know, that, you know, about who he is, you know, she, she, we don't talk about it and no, it's not like I am brokenhearted and sitting in the corner. <laughs> does does she, she know the story? She, I don't know if she knows the story, but she definitely knows that I, uh, am connected in some way to to him, and he will always have to be a part of my name and my life. Um, so she is aware of that. Yeah, she's never asked me any questions, um, but she's you know in fifth grade. Um, they know how to Google things. They are smart. She uh, has seen people come up to me and ask me questions or talk to me. And she's she knows that that name is something that surrounds me, just like she knows the name Andy O'Grady is something that surrounds me, which was my fiance that died. And she was not born at that time, but has grown up knowing that he's part of my life, my history, part of my bones kind of. So going forward till the day I die, that story will be part of my bones, unfortunately. you know. Do you think though, like, wouldn't you be the one, wouldn't you rather be the one that to talk to her about that story than 
fifth graders in school, like, cause fifth grade, like kids are just mean. And yeah. so it's, it won't be a productive conversation in school. It'll be, how do we make fun of this person or how do we take them down a notch? Whereas maybe if it's coming from you, it comes out in a different light that she can look at it in a different way. I agree. Uh, you know, I've never sat her down and been like, listen, if people say this, let me tell you this so that mm -hmm. you can counter you know, respond to what they're saying. Um, so we've never had that conversation, but she's never acted embarrassed because I think she thinks the quote unquote fame that I have that goes along with it, like precedes that, you know, uh, she doesn't see me as a weak or sad person or someone who shies away from anything. So I think anytime someone brings something up to her, she just thinks, well, my, you know, my mom's gotten through this and she's, sort of somewhat famous or well recognized. Um, but she, you know, she doesn't think anything negative per se. I mean, she knows it was some, not something positive for me because I don't like to talk about it, but she, you know, she has not been to the point where she's been bullied about it, but you're right. I mean, at some point somebody will be nasty to her and say things about me to her. And I want to prep her with how to respond to that so that she can respond uh, and have a good quip coming back. But then when she internalizes it, she doesn't get angry with me for embarrassing mm -hmm. her. So I, d I do think that's important. Yeah. Yeah, no, Rich, I, I, I appreciate your conversation with this. It's, it's just a very good perspective again, that some people don't think I'm a big guy on perspectives and hearing you to speak gives me a different perspective or a different way of looking at the whole matter. So, and I think a lot of people, um, you know, if they didn't see the HBO special is just kind of, uh, listen to you speak. It's like, okay, I understand her side a lot more. Uh, my last question, I guess for you is F Mary kill tiger, David Boreans and Derek Jeter. <laughs> um, <laughs> my God. Are you serious? You know I mean? I mean, sort of, but yeah. Oh, okay. Fuck Mary kill. Um, I guess I would fuck David Boreanaz. Um, no, that's not true. I would kill David Boreanaz. I would fuck Tiger and I would marry Derek Jeter. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe you answered that. I love that. Um, no, no. I, honestly, I, I, I'm, I really appreciate it. And honestly, your podcast, I think it's based on just the guests you're having besides Dax. I think it's just a really interesting conversation. Again, I'm, like I said. 30 seconds ago, so, I'm a big guy in perspective. So I think your perspective like, is, is incredible. I, it's a great idea. I came off your podcast telling Adam that I love the concept so much of what you're doing on the podcast. Of So it's obviously called Misunderstood with Rachel, you could tell. But it's about someone's life who has been defined by a headline and what what that's how that's affected their life and what you may not know about them. And so I know that you've had that's like great. That. Barnes on are you, are you planning on having like um Tanya Harding or Monica Lewinsky any of those kind of people because I feel like there's so many stories about these infamous people that are human yeah. beings on the other side of the headline yeah a hundred percent so by the way I'm doing it all myself like I don't have a book or anybody that I book I basically book myself or the producer I'm working with um is helping me and so um I'm just targeting one person at a time. I have a whole list. Yes. Tanya is on my list. Um, but like I, and Monica, you know, I feel like she's told her story quite a number of times, so she's not necessarily high on my list, but of course I would love to have her. Right. I want to hear from her, especially cause she has such a similar story to mine. Right. We were put in the same, um, situation. So, or, in, you know, the way that the, we, our stories were narrated. So I would love to talk to her and, and I, I have spoken to her in the past, you know, and a lot of these people I, I have direct access to, but I've interviewed some really good people and I pick people that I want to hear their story because I think they've been misunderstood. So, and, and of course, you know, you would automatically think of really famous people like a Pamela Anderson or uh, again, a Monica Lewinsky, but I'm also trying to target people that, um, are maybe less known because I think their story is a universal story that people will really, really identify with. Um, so, you know, like other people that I've had are Tara Newell, who was the girl who killed the original Dirty John. Um, you know, her mom was stalked by Dirty John. I think her story is so unbelievable because she's 
basically a murderer, but she had a reason for doing it and what that was like to be part of the Dirty John story. So her, her episode I thought was amazing. Um, you know, I have, um, you know, all sorts of interesting people coming up today. I interviewed an, an amazing guy. His name is Lee Asher from the Asher house. He start. I don't know if you guys know him, but his story is unbelievable. He saves animals, rescues animals, but his story is so much bigger than the animals because he was so misunderstood as a kid and through his life and his whole journey of how he did this. And you go onto his Instagram with a million followers and he puts you on a journey of watching these animals and how he changes their lives, but how people should give love to people that were, are different or cast aside or misunderstood because it changes these animals' lives. And I think it's such a great, you know, message. So those are the kind of, kind of stories I'm looking forward to getting out because I think that people will really connect with that. But of course, I'm going to have Stormy Daniels and, you know, all these sorts of people that their stories need to be told. But those are people that are almost harder to book because sometimes people want money. Like I really want Conrad Murray on, the guy who was accused mm-hmm. of killing um, Michael Jackson. I think he is a fantastic um, example of somebody who may be misunderstood. And I want to hear his story. But unfortunately, you know, some people want money for their story he wants $50,000 to come on to a podcast, which of course, I'm not going to pay to get your story out. If you really want to tell your story, you should you should want it out and not necessarily want the money for it. Oh, yeah, we've hit a lot of roadblocks the same way. We're like, hey, we want to see if they can come on. Sure, what's your budget? Uh, yes. Zero. So yeah. if they want to come on and talk, that would be great. But uh, yeah, you guys should jef- definitely check out Misunderstood. And I'm telling you, the best premiere episode you are ever going to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was my episode. We had we had a, a fun time chatting about um, the, the days of Tiger Woods and um, how that all went down and just kind of rehashing how Rachel became one of the the most well-known names in the world literally overnight and so just kind of how that transition went so highly recommend you guys going checking out misunderstood and it's like m-i-s-s space understood yes uh, thank you and and i just want to say about that episode you were on i my the purpose of that was to really let people know the power of the media and how Mm -hmm. that really can shape someone's life and you know tmz was and has been, you know, such a big force in creating the narrative of a story. So I really wanted to, even though it was my premiere episode and I was not not good at this yet, you know, I just felt like my goal there was to try and um, get people to understand like what happens behind the scenes at a network like that, how you tell a story, how you narrate a story. And um, because it was, it was a, a business that affected my life. And I, so I wanted to hear from somebody who was on the inside of that. Yeah, and I got a lot of comments from it. A lot of people were hitting up saying that they thought it was really interesting, a good conversation, that they found the whole topic really fascinating. So I think yeah. uh, I think the concept of the podcast is doing well. And uh, yeah, I wish you much uh, luck in this podcasting crazy world. Thank you. Thank you. And your podcast is amazing. And it's so great to see you guys in a circumstance where you're not hounding me, chasing me down, <laughs> standing there with the camera, asking me crazy questions. So I prefer questions being asked this way. I so mean, I do kind of m- miss the days of you having to crawl in your front window while all yes. the paparazzi were watching, but I digress. You can never say never. It's, you know, <laughs> I'm on my next decade here, so maybe I'm due soon. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Thank you guys so much. That was fun. Dude, you know, I you never know what you're going to get when you have a guest on. And I like, I like the honesty, you know, I'm not saying every decision she's made in her life is a good decision. And I think she admits that. Um, But I think having to navigate through that and listening to what someone has to navigate through is a fascinating listen. She's just cool. You know, I don't know. Just, like that's the best way. She's cool. She gets it in in a way. Mm-hmm. Like she's cool. Like I can understand why celebrities gravitate towards her because she's just she's cool. Um, like I don't know. I've been around her a few times now over the last decade of me doing this, and she's always been just like chill and cool and and nice. Uh, it's good to hear her perspective. This is the longest conversation I've ever had with her. So, um, but and you know, I can't believe she answered the f Mary kill. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I threw that out there, dude. I was like, oh, this is going to go bad. This is going to go bad. Um, I could but... not believe she answered it. That was fucking amazing. Did you get weird? Were you nervous about that? or were, were you Yes. Like, oh, Are no. you kidding me? When you do one of your fucking crazy questions that I'm just like 
cringing like oh god what's gonna happen oh god what's gonna happen and then she she fucking played ball it was crazy um yeah. so yeah i can already see that one hitting the headlines just because i know what we have a lot of like reporters and stuff that listen to our podcast uh, and i can already see them salivating right now over that one um yeah. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for listening. Come join us on our Facebook page. It is the private Facebook group called Off the Record. Search it out. It is where we have so much fun with all of our listeners. I'm going to post a question in there. Uh, maybe before this one even airs, uh, we want to do like a ask me anything. Only it's going to be a ask us anything. Uh, and so we can do a whole episode on answering questions that you guys want. Nothing's off limits. Ask us whatever you want. We're going to devote a, an episode just to you guys and what you want to know from us or what you want to know from our past or our jobs or, again, anything. And so I'm going to go ahead and post that in there and we'll let that start banking a bunch of questions. I'm sure there's going to be a ton coming in. We've got thousands of fans or followers or friends or whatever you want to call in there. And, uh, you know, I've told you guys the first thing I do after we release a new episode is I run in there. I want to see what you guys have to say. I want to see your feedback. I want to see what excited you, what pissed you off, what uh, got you interested for the day. So I am very active inside the Facebook group. I know Adam's very active and we truly appreciate all of our, our friends inside the Off the Record Facebook group. So come join us. Uh, take a moment. Go leave us a review on iTunes if you can. Find our, our, our page. Scroll down to the bottom. Leave a five-star review. Write something kind or mean or whatever. Just five stars. Sign your name so we can read it at the top of the show. Um, you can follow me at Dax Holt. You can follow Adam at Adam Glenn. And uh, did I miss anything there, buddy? Nope. Good job. See you guys later. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> guys hope you like that video we got a lot more where that came from hit that bell like subscribe share with a friend the best thing to support us is really doing that and uh we really need the money because we, we need hair gel <laughs>